So thank you very much, John, for the introduction. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming. Let me get started. Um, so when I first learned about electrical circuits in primary school, my teacher used an analogy with, uh, with water circuits. Right? So you can think of the wires and pipes, and you can think of the battery as a pump. And, and I liked that analogy a lot, actually. And so I was very disappointed when I uh, went to college, and I was told that actually this analogy was wrong for several reasons. And, um, and I guess three years ago, when I started working on this, I realized that actually sometimes this analogy could be right. And at least that's one of my motivations, that actually, if that's true, then we can actually keep using this analogy uh, without uh, lying to our school children. So, 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 so let me say first why in most of the cases this analogy is wrong. So the reason is that the, the way electric current is carried in a wire is very different from the way uh, water uh, flows in a pipe. So the reason is that in a metal, uh, the, the resistance arises uh, due to the conduction electrons scattering of defects of the lattice, of the ionic lattice. Right, so these defects could be impurities, vacancies, or it could be vibrations of the lattice, so phonons. And on the other hand, for water in a pipe, it's completely different because there's no lattice. There's just water molecules hitting each other. And in this case, the resistance really arises through uh, the viscosity of the fluid, which arises due to the internal scattering between the water molecules. And so that's why most of the time, actually, these two are very different. But the goal of today is actually to study solid state systems in which electrons transport current, like uh, in this example. So here is the outline. Um, so first I'm going to uh, define electron hydrodynamics and why I think it's interesting, why it brings, it brings up interesting conceptual questions. Then I will focus on a particular example uh, that is probably one of the simplest ones, which is a viscous Fermi liquid. And I will show how we can detect these viscous effects by using magnetic fields, and, and then I will finish with a conclusion. So here is the plan for the introduction. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bring together two uh, well-established uh, fields of physics. On one side, correlated electrons and, and, and solid state transport, and on the other side, hydrodynamics. And then we will see that actually doing this will bring up interesting conceptual questions about hydrodynamics and its interplay with uh, quantum mechanics. So let me start with, uh, with uh, the correlated electrons. Um, so in a solid, we have a lot of quantum particles interacting with each other. And, and, and most of what we do as theorists in this field is trying to guess what's going to be their collective behavior as a phase. And, and indeed, in certain cases, it leads to very exotic and uh, unusual types of phases, like uh, spin liquids, topological phases, superconductors, and so on. And one of the most natural ways of probing a solid state system is to measure its transport properties. And one of the simplest one is actually the resistivity. Um, and so this is why as theorists, we end up spending a lot of time actually uh, trying to predict and calculate these transport properties. Uh, because then it's a, a very natural thing to compare with experiments. And actually, for most metals, there's a, a fairly old theory due to Drude that works very well to understand the resistivity. And again, uh, this resistivity arises due, due to this uh, so-called external scattering where the electrons are scattered off impurities of the underlying ionic lattice. And as you can see here, the, 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 the most important parameter in this formula is tau, which is the mean free time between these collisions. Um, so one thing that is a bit disappointing from a theory's point of view is that actually electron-electron uh, scattering actually does not enter this tau. And, and mo most of the time, actually, electron-electron scattering plays a very minor role in transport in solids. And, and so actually, so this is an excerpt from uh, Ashcroft and Mermin, which is where I first learned about solid state physics. And so, um, so, so this is somewhat disappointing because as I showed on the previous slide, uh, these electron-electron interactions are actually responsible for what I think are the most interesting phases. And so the fact that it's mostly relevant for transport is, is somewhat disappointing. But actually today we will, we will, we will uh, study a class of, of systems where actually the, the viscosity becomes a dominant uh, contribution to the resistivity. And indeed, this viscosity arises due to this scattering. So this is an exception to this sentence in Ashcroft Mermin. Right, so now going to the hydrodynamics part. So 
uh, in short, hydrodynamics is a universal description of fluids, and and the universality arises when we probe when, when we probe fluids at large length scales and large time scales. So the idea is that we don't really need to know the microscopic details of what's going on between the small particles, as long as we probe the system. In this case, for example, applying by applying uh, a certain poten a, 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 a perturbing potential as long as the length scale over which we probe the fluid is much larger than the microscopic length scale of the fluid, then the description that we can use is actually universal. And this microscopic length scale in this case would be, for example, the mean free path for the internal scattering between the particles. So here is a, a concrete example. Let's say we have a, a gas in, in a channel of width W. Um, and so the, the important thing here is that of course, these particles are going to collide with each other. Uh, we don't really need to know so much about the details of, of these collisions. What we need to know is that momentum is conserved before and after the collision. And therefore, what we need to do is actually to study the, the dynamics and the, the conservation of this uh, momentum. And so the idea is to coarse grain this channel into small boxes of typical size L, where L is the uh, microscopic length scale, uh, in this case, for example, the mean free path. And then we can define some coarse grain quantity, in this case, which I call uh, V, which would be the velocity field of my, uh, of my gas. Uh, I will use velocity and uh, momentum interchangeably. And, and then if you actually study the dynamics of this coarse grain uh, potential, uh, we end up with, uh, with a fluid equation like this, where on the left-hand side we have the material derivative of the velocity uh, field. And on the right-hand side we have the forces that are applied on, on the, all the particles inside the box, right? And so, of course, we have the external force F, but then we also have this term that arises, which is the viscous term. And this viscous term actually arises due to these internal collisions, right? So as you can see that this, this viscous term actually corresponds to a diffusion of the momentum density. And, and indeed, one can uh, understand that if, if there are two boxes next to each other, and on average, one of the boxes one of, one of the box has a, has, has a higher uh, momentum density than the other one, then the collisions will tend to um, equilibrate the momentum density between these two boxes, and indeed this is what this diffusion term will, will model. Um, right, and so eta will, is, is a viscosity and it will, it will enter a lot in, uh, in the discussion today. All right, so, so now having said that, I will just uh, bring up two, uh, I think, interesting conceptual questions that arise if, if one wants to study hydrodynamics for quantum particles like electrons in solids. And one of them is, uh, can quantum mechanics actually constrain hydrodynamics in some ways? So, as I've just explained, the, the nice thing about hydrodynamics is that it's a universal description of fluids in the sense that I could have here different kinds of, of, of fluids, so the different colors could correspond to completely different microscopic physics, but, but they all, if you probe them at, at, at large uh, uh, length scales, they will all be um, um, modeled by this, uh, Navier by this instance of the Navier-Stokes equation. So the form of this equation is really uh, universal. But then in this equation, as you can see, there are some coefficients. In this case, uh, for example, the viscosity, right? The vis if I want to actually compute the viscosity, then I actually need to go back and look at the microscopic details of of, of the given fluid that I'm interested in if I want to compute eta, right? So, so, you, so if you're on the, the equation is universal, but the coefficients that are in them are usually not. So in classical mechanics, viscosity could virtually take any value, right? So it depends on the details. But then interestingly, uh, once you add quantum mechanics into the mix, there were actually some uh, conjectured fundamental bounds even on the coefficients inside the equation, in this case, on the viscosity. So, so, so t this bound, uh, the idea is that one should uh, normalize the viscosity by the entropy density of the fluid, but once you um, compute this ratio, there is a, a conjecture that there is a minimal uh, bound um, for which the, the viscosity can never go below uh, this, um, this value, which as you can see depends only on h bar and kb, so it's a completely universal uh, bound. So the reason why this bound was formulated is actually coming from uh, very highbrow uh, physics that actually I don't know that much about. But I think the, the interesting point here is that actually quantum mechanics could lead to even more universality in the sense that not, not even the fluid uh, equation is universal, but there could even be some universal bounds on what the coefficients inside that equation can be. 
Um, and I would be happy to uh, talk more about this in the Q&A afterwards. Um, so now I just want to mention another conceptual question that arises, and which is how quantum mechanics can actually enrich uh, hydrodynamics. And so as, as, as you may know, for electrons in the solid, the kinetic energy is not just p squared over 2m like in vacuum, but because of the ionic lattice and because the electrons actually see this potential of the ionic lattice, the one actually needs to solve the so-called block equation. And, and the outcome of that is that we get the dispersion relation for the electrons and we also get block eigenve eigenvectors that depend on the momentum in the Brouillard zone. And, and both of these um, uh, outcomes can actually lead to non-trivial effects. So for example, electrons uh, in a solid can behave like relativistic particles that have no mass. That happens in graphene, in vile semi-metals, and so on. And the reason is that the dispersion relation can have this uh, cone shape. And if indeed the chemical potential is close to the middle of the band, then the particles, the electrons, will actually behave like uh, relativistic particles. And therefore, if they behave like a, if they start behaving like a fluid, this would be a relativistic kind of fluid with a completely different kind of hydrodynamics uh, than the Navier-Stokes, for example. And then another way in which uh, solids can lead to interesting phenomena is, is also even the wave function itself, the psi of k, can have some non-trivial topology as you move around in the Brouillard zone. And this non-trivial topology can also lead to interesting effects at the hydrodynamic level. Like for example, uh, something that is called the whole viscosity, um, which is a viscous version of the whole effect. And I will, I will come back to this in the second part of the talk. All right, so after this uh, somewhat long introduction, um, I'm actually going to uh, describe in details uh, the kind of systems uh, where we could actually uh, see uh, viscous flows of electrons. So I'm, I will focus now on viscous fermi liquids. Um, okay, so here is the idea. So I'm going to define two different mean free paths, uh, LMR and LMC. And so these two length scales are actually quite important. Uh, and I'm going to refer to them a lot in, in, in the rest of the talk, so please bear with me. So first of all, let's define LMR. So MR is for momentum relaxing. The idea is that it's the mean free path associated with any kind of scattering that relaxes the momentum of the electrons. So that could be when the electron hits an impurity or hits a phonon, for example. And so it's really, so these kinds of scattering, of course, we don't want them to be too frequent because the Navier-Stokes formalism is really relies on the conservation of momentum. So that's why we want this momentum relaxing mean free path to be as large as possible. And we want it to be actually larger than the sample size so that at, for all practical purposes, at the, at the level of, of our sample, momentum will be almost conserved, and therefore it actually makes sense to write a conservation equation for it. Okay, so now there is a second condition for hydrodynamics to hold, is that we want the microscopic length scale to be much smaller than the sample size. Right? We want to probe the fluid at a much larger length scale than the microscopic um, length scale associated with this time the internal scattering. So the scattering between electrons, the, ones, the one that actually conserves momentum and that will lead to this viscous term in the fluid equation, okay? So basically the idea is that to, for, to have viscous electrons in the solid, we are between a rock and a hard place because we want, we want LMR to be very large and LMC to be very small. And if that's the case, then we can make a mesoscopic sample of intermediate sizes that will be just in the right spot so that momentum will be almost conserved and so that hydrodynamics will actually hold because the sample size is much bigger than the microscopic length scale. Okay, so this is quite important for the rest. So if there's, if there's any question about this, I can, I can answer it now. Okay. So, so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So yeah, so actually I should mention that, so this idea actually dates back to, uh, initially to Guji in 1963, and it's been revived um, by, by theorists several times since then, but, uh, but the recent interest really arose due to um, very recent experiments in graphene that I will um, uh, go over shortly, or oh, actually right now. So, um, yeah, so basically now the question is like, okay, in terms of numbers, what do we expect for these length scales? Like, well, what, what is actually uh, uh, something that we could work with? Well, actually, um, in practice, in the recent experiments, what has happened is that 
if you want LMR to be big, you want, you want to be able to make very clean samples, and you also want to be at not too high temperature. So clean samples means that there are a few impurities, and not too high temperature because if the temperature is too high, you will have too, many phonon, too, too much phonon scattering, and that will also uh, tend to decrease LMR. So that's the first condition. You also want LMC to be very small, which means that you want strong interactions between your electrons, such that this LMC will be uh, small enough. And in this case, you don't want to be at too low temperature because, uh, because of, the, of the Pauli blocking. Uh, if you take a Fermi liquid at too low temperature, the, LM, the mean free part associated with the internal scattering actually uh, gets very large at low temperature. And, and, then, and, then, and then you want to be able to make mesoscopic samples of intermediate sizes. And, and so, so, the, so they were initial experiments in two DEGs uh, in the 90s, and then more recently, uh, there were experiments in, uh, in a high mobility uh, metal, palladium cobaltate, and mostly in graphene. Um, and there's been a lot of experiments since 2016. Uh, so graphene has uh, several advantages. Uh, first of all, one can make actually very pure samples. And on, another one is that by gating the graphene sheet, one can actually uh, uh, basically change the Fermi energy. So you know, how, how far you are from the, uh, from the middle of the, of the band. And, by changing, and actually by changing the Fermi energy, that gives an extra knob to actually tune LMC. Because if I make the Fermi energy smaller and keep the same temperature, I'm actually going to increase the interactions and therefore decrease LMC. So, so the nice thing about graphene is that there is both the temperature and the gate voltage that can be tuned to try to uh, achieve that, that regime. Okay, so now that I've described these three length scales, let me define different regimes that one can obtain depending on the ordering. So, in, you know, in, in most cases, most metals are in the ohmic regime, where the sample size W is much larger than, uh, than the two mean free path. And in this case, we, we, we just have the usual Ohm's law, where essentially only LMR really matters uh, for the resistivity. And, and LMC, which is the internal scattering between the electrons, is mostly irrelevant. Uh, then there is the another extreme when the sample size W is much smaller than uh, both mean free path. And in this case, the particles will actually hit the boundaries of the sample much more frequently than anything else. And in this case, the resistivity will actually be dominated by surface, uh, by how, how, for example, how rough the surface is. And then, and then, of course, we have this intermediate regime, which is the one that we are interested in. Now, we will see that in practice, the difficulty will be to distinguish between viscous effects and, and what I call, in this case, ba diffuse ballistic or uh, basically ballistic effects, right? So the difficulty will be to distinguish between these two, uh, and I will, I will say more about that shortly. Okay so, uh, okay, so now we are back on the slide about the viscous fluid. Now let's try to apply this to uh, conduction electrons in a metal. So then what is going to change? Well, the main thing that's going to change is that now I have, I have uh, actually momentum relaxing scattering as well. So I need to, let's say, account for impurities, for example. So I have this extra kind of scattering, which leads to an extra term in the hydrodynamic description. And, and the simplest way to take this term into account is actually to add um, this, uh, this term here, which is really uh, a sink of momentum to the environment. So as you can see, uh, this term really leads to uh, a, um, a decrease of the momentum with a rate that is given by one over the momentum relaxing mean free time, okay? And, and of course now the external force is given by the electric field and, and my electrical current is proportional to the, moment, to the momentum density. Okay, so now that we have uh, this, this, uh, this equation for, um, for the velocity field, we can study different regimes depending on which term dominates. So let's say now, if this term actually dominates, so the, the momentum sink or the momentum relaxing uh, scattering dominates, then we are in the ohmic regime, right? So we could, we could completely set this one to zero, and then we just, we just find back Ohm's law, um, and Ohm's law where the momentum relaxing uh, mean free time appears. And, and so this is usually what happens you know, in, in most cases, but then you could also imagine a case where you set this term strictly to zero and you only keep the viscous term. And, and again, it, and let's say we actually look for a stationary flow, so we set dTV to zero, then we just end up with this relation between current and electric field. 
But as you can see, this relation now is, is, is actually very different from, from Ohm's law. So we don't have Ohm's law anymore. And actually now we have this non-local relation between current and electric field, right? So I really need, if I want to find the current, I need to do the electric field everywhere in the sample if I want to solve this equation, okay? Um, now, what does that entail in practice? Well, one, one consequence of this is that if I compute the curl of J in this case, if, if my conductivity is uniform in space, then in, in a stationary state, I will actually get that the curl of J is always zero. And therefore, that limits very drastically the, 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 what, uh, what the current can do. While in this case, if I compute the curl of J, for example, I can get something on zero, and then indeed, I can actually get some more complicated patterns and vorticity and so on for my electric field. For my, sorry, for my uh, current. Um, right, so now in this channel geometry, we can compute the uh, resistivity uh, on both sides. And so of course here we just get one over sigma, so we just get back to the formula where I have the momentum relaxing mean free time uh, on the right hand side. But then here, I can define also resistivity by averaging the current over, over the full width of the channel, right? So this is an average quantity over the section of the channel. And as you can see here, uh, now the resistivity is proportional to the viscosity. And, but now it also depends on the width of the channel and, and, it, and it goes as one over W squared. So, so T squared is just because we have a, a Laplacian in the, in the viscous term in the Magister Stokes equation. So basically the, the, the bottom line here is that, you know, these two regimes should be very easy to distinguish because in this case, the resistivity would actually scale uh, with the width of the channel, while of course, in this regime, the resistivity uh, should not depend on the size of the channel, okay? Um, right, so maybe some of you have noticed that I've actually, uh, 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 actually this convection term here, it actually vanished from one side to the other. So the reason is that, so the, the reason is that actually it's, it's uh, in the kind of uh, systems we are interested in right now, it's mostly negligible. So the Reynolds number is actually the good ratio uh, to compare the, this convection term uh, to the viscous term. And you know, at, at low Reynolds number, we have viscous flows. Uh, we have very viscous flows, while at higher Reynolds number, then actually this nonlinear term becomes very important. And it actually can lead to all sorts of very complicated and interesting phenomena in, in, in fluid mechanics like turbulence. Um, actually, one can show fairly easily that in the kind of systems we are interested in, in solids, most of the times, the Reynolds number is gonna be extremely small. And it's, going to actually, it's actually a challenge to reach high Reynolds number. And it, 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 that's also actually a, um, a topic of uh, current research right now. But for, for the sake of today, I'll focus on low Reynolds number flows. And so that's why I can actually kill this uh, convection term. Right, so, okay, so now I would like to show how we can use magnetic fields to detect uh, these uh, viscous effects in, in solids. Um, right, so, so as I've just shown, the, the idea is, um, one idea to actually um, identify viscous effects is to look for size dependence in transport properties, right? Because we, we just showed that the resistivity, for example, should scale like one over the width of the channel squared. Um, but the problem is that ballistic effects where the electron the scattering on the boundary is actually a dominant process in, for the resistivity, these ballistic effects can also lead, of course, to size-dependent resistivity. And so we need to distinguish between uh, these two cases. And we will see that using a magnetic field is actually a very good idea for that. So basically the proposal here is to do a viscous version of the, of the, of the well-known hole experiment where we have a hole bar, so like a, basically a two-dimensional uh, metal, we have a transverse magnetic field and we are injecting a current like this and then we are going to measure voltage both uh, parallel to the current but also perpendicular to it. Uh, okay, so, so now let's add a magnetic field to, the, to, our, to the, our fluid equation. So now two things happen when we, when we do that. First of, all, first of all, we get a V cross V term, which is the Lorentz force. Uh, but then on top of that, we also get an extra uh, piece which is a viscous term, but a viscous term that is actually, that applies a force that is perpendicular to the flow. So in that sense, this is why it's called a whole viscosity, right? So it's a viscous term, but, but at the same time, it's, it's a whole term because it's in the same direction as the Lorentz force. Um, and indeed, this whole viscosity can only appear once you break time reversal symmetry, which is what we did by adding a magnetic field. 
All right, so now let me compare, now we have two viscous terms in our equation. We have the usual shear viscosity that, that, uh, that we, we all have a good intuition about, and then there was this whole viscosity, which is a bit more unusual, and one way to think about it is if you, have, if you had a solid disk that is rotating inside a fluid, well, the shear viscosity would apply a torque on this disk that would prevent you from making it rotate. On the other hand, the, the viscous hole term would actually correspond to a, a, a pressure a pressure force that would be applied on the disk and whose sign uh, would actually depend on, on, on the direction of rotation of the disk, okay? And of course, the, the, the reason why that can happen is that the fluid itself breaks time reversal symmetry and has a preferred uh, direction of rotation, right? Because by applying magnetic field, we have chosen a, a particular a direction of rotation. Okay, so, let, so the idea will be that we can probe the shear viscosity by probing rho xx, so the longitudinal resistivity, and we will probe the whole viscosity by probing rho xy, so the whole resistivity, the transverse uh, voltage. Okay, so let me start with the shear viscosity. Um, right, so we can solve this fluid equation in the right geometry and applying, let's say, for example, no slip boundary condition. Um, and then what we get is something like this, where the resistivity, again, averaged over the width of the channel has two contributions. There is the bulk contribution, which is just the usual one. So as you can see, it's a Drude formula where only the momentum relaxing term appears. And, but then on top of that, we have, we have this extra piece that is proportional to the viscosity and that again has this one over W squared uh, factor, okay? And, uh, okay, so now I'm plotting the resistivity over its bulk value versus magnetic field and for different width. So an infinitely wide channel would be the green curve because then the resistivity would just take its bulk value. But then as you go to uh, smaller and smaller channels, so going from green to blue, as you can see, the resistivity has an extra contribution that is exactly coming from this viscous term, okay? But then interestingly, this uh, extra contribution coming from the viscous term actually decreases with magnetic field and leads to a negative magnetoresistance. And the reason for that is that the, the viscosity itself actually decreases with magnetic field. So one can actually uh, use Boltzmann theory to compute this, but the, basically the, the, the upshot is that the viscosity under magnetic field is equal to its zero field value times this Lorentzian decay with field. And so this is why this extra contribution to the resistivity actually decreases with magnetic field. And, and if you went to very large field, eventually you would find back the, the bulk uh, value for the resistivity. Um, okay, so, so now, so far I've only been solving uh, the fluid equation, but in practice, um, you know, th this, this would be okay if, if we were really deep in the hydrodynamic regime, we could then just solve the fluid equation, that would be very simple. But in practice, what happens is that all these length scales are actually not that different from each other, and, and therefore we actually need to check that we are indeed in the hydrodynamic regime. And the way to do it is actually to solve a, a kinetic equation, to actually solve the Boltzmann equation for the electrons, where we take into account uh, various things. So first of all, on the right-hand side, we have both kinds of scattering, so the momentum relaxing scattering and the momentum conserving scattering, which is the one um, uh, associated with the electron-electron scattering. Okay, so, so, uh, so F, of course, is just the distribution of my, of my electrons. Um, and that depends both on the position and in momentum space. I have here uh, the spatial derivative of my distribution, and, and here I have the Lorentz force. Okay, and then on top of that, we also need to account for the, uh, the boundary scattering, uh, which will also be very important, especially if we want to study um, the, the ballistic effects. Okay, so, so the nice thing about this equation is that then we can actually tune uh, so LMR and LMC or tau MR and, to, and tau MC. So we can tune these different length scales and, and also the system size and we can actually look at the different regimes and the crossover between them, okay? So, so first of all, we can actually, you know, in the code, we can actually uh, choose a case when indeed W is deep in the hydro regime where LMC is very small, LMR is very big and the simple size is in the middle and indeed then we recover uh, this uh, Lorentzian decay of the resistivity. So as you can see, basically, it, so we actually recover uh, this solution coming from the, from the fluid equation, but in this case, you know, there was actually much more work involved to get that because we actually solved for the full 
distribution of electrons uh, in the sample with the Boltzmann equation, but at least it's good that we recover uh, what we should. But now we can actually check what, what, what would this plot look like if we were in the ballistic regime. And in the ballistic regime, you actually get something fairly different. So of course, the ballistic regime would be the case when the sample size is much smaller than anything else. Uh, and, it, and, and you can see that, so there are, um, it's really qualitatively different for several reasons. Um, so one reason is that you can see here there's a cusp when, and actually in this case the magnetic field is scaled such that uh, two means that the cyclotron diameter is exactly equal to uh, the width of the sample. And so, of course, if, it's, if, if you are ballistic indeed, then something drastic should happen here because if you increase further the field, then the, the, the electrons can actually go in skipping orbits that never touch the boundary, and they can actually do that forever. While in this case, of course, nothing special should happen at two because the electrons can never go in full orbits anyway. They keep being hit by other electrons. Um, and, and then you can see as well that here there's actually a maximum in the resistivity, while, while here the maximum is at zero field. Um, so actually, so, so it actually convinces us that uh, looking for such a Lorentzian decay of the resistivity that is size dependent is actually a good observable to look for a viscous effect in solids. Um, so actually, um, the, shortly after um, this, this paper was published, there was actually uh, several papers that measured the viscosity in, in graphene, and he was, um, so here I'm, I'm actually uh, plotting um, the viscosity that was measured in graphene in this work. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's actually given, you know, in meter squared per second. And, and, then, and then you can actually measure viscosity in graphene, and then you can actually compare it with other known fluids. Um, and, and I don't know if, if somebody wants to take a guess at where the electrons in graphene, let's say 200 Kelvin, would be on this chart. Um, but uh, basically, they are, they are quite viscous. So you see, like, they are between honey and tar. That would be electrons in graphene at 200 Kelvin. Um, and, and, and one way to understand it is that um, basically electrons in, in a, a fairly degenerate a fluid are uh, weakly interacting. And actually weakly interacting fluids have, uh, have actually very high uh, viscosity, right? So, so in other words, if I were to actually now, you know, compare this viscosity with the bound, that I, with the fundamental bound that I um, uh, told you about earlier, like this, this viscosity is actually much higher than the bound. So the bound is mostly irrelevant for this because the bound is saturated by the most interacting fluids possible, okay? And, and these Fermi liquids are actually uh, comparatively very weakly interacting. So, 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 so the bound um, is fairly irrelevant for these Fermi liquids, but then, of course, the, 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 it's the first step, and the hope would actually be to uh, eventually study uh, more interacting fluids where the bound could actually become uh, relevant. Okay, so now we can switch to the whole viscosity, uh, which will be probed by the, by the whole resistivity. And, okay, so just a, a, a short, uh, just a historical perspective on, on the whole effect. So, so, of course, so the whole effect, so I just, uh, as I just described, so when you inject current in a, in a metallic slab and you have a transverse magnetic field, then a, a transverse voltage will actually appear. Uh, now, one way to plot this is actually to look at sigma xy, so the whole conductivity. Uh, versus magnetic field, and, and it is, so of course, at low fields, it is linear in a magnetic field, but then if you go to large enough fields, it should actually have, have uh, this shape. And then if you look closely here, actually, you, you could see some steps, and these steps actually correspond to the quantum Hall effect, okay? Uh, so, uh, so the idea is that at large enough magnetic fields, you actually get Landau levels, and then what matters is actually how many Landau levels have you filled, which is this number nu, and the whole conductivity in the right units is just given by this number and therefore forms plateaus. So basically what I want to talk about now is a viscous version of this where one can also um, define a whole viscosity, eta xy. Um, again, at uh, low magnetic fields, it's proportional to B, but at higher fields, it also starts to decay like this. Um, and, and it has been, um, um, I guess from a theory, from a theory standpoint, it should also happen that the whole viscosity should be quantized in gapped uh, systems, right? Um, 
And, and, and actually, so that's why, that, that's one of the main reasons why there's actually a lot of interest in this quantity, the whole viscosity, because actually it could serve as well as a topological quantum number that distinguish different kinds of topological phases. Uh, but of course, that would be for, for a gapped phase that one could obtain in the uh, highly quantizing magnetic fields, while today we will only focus uh, on this low field regime. But of course, this is, a, this is an important first step because even the, the, the classical viscous hole effect had not been measured so far in solid state system. So, so we, we, can, we can look at the same uh, equation, but now just measure uh, rho xy instead of rho xx. And what we find is that, again, there is a, a correction to the bulk value of rho xy that, again, is proportional now to the whole viscosity, and that has this 1 over w squared uh, factor as well. So that, that will also have this size dependence. Um, uh, okay, so in this case, the bulk value is just, is just this, um, this simple formula. Uh, so the idea would be that the whole viscosity can be measured by looking at finite size effects uh, in the whole resistivity this time, trying to extract this contribution, okay? Um, actually, so again, very uh, shortly after our paper was published, uh, actually the, the f uh, what I think is the first measurement of the whole viscosity in a solid state system was performed in graphene uh, by the group of uh, Denis Van Duren and André Geim. And, and so here you can show, you can see the whole viscosity versus magnetic field. So as you can see, they are, uh, of course, only looking at the linear regime. Uh, so it would really be correspond to uh, this circle here. And, and now this is a plot of the whole viscosity per Tesla as a function of temperature. Um, okay, so I think, um, so that's it for, for the first part of the talk. Now, for the, for the remaining uh, of the talk, I just wanna talk about local properties. Because so far, I've, I've, I've always been talking about these um, uh, resistivities that were averaged over the width of the channel. But of course, in hydrodynamics, now we really have this, uh, this field of velocity, the field of, of current, and so it could have uh, non-trivial uh, local properties as well, right? If we, look, if we could resolve spatially, we could measure spatially these profiles. Um, and and so, so, yeah, so for the minute of the talk, I will, I will talk about these uh, local properties. Um, so naively, one would think that, of course, there should be a difference, right? If I could measure just the, the current density in my channel, in the ohmic case, I would just expect what is called a plug flow, right? So the velocity should just basically um, be um, very flat in the channel, right? In the hydro regime, it would be this uh, famous Poiseuil profile that is parabolic, right? Um, so, so one could think that that's actually very easy, but of course, there will be also the ballistic uh, regime that we need to distinguish from, and ballistic regimes can also lead actually to current profiles that look fairly similar. Uh, so actually here is some, again, so this is coming from a Boltzmann calculation where we can actually basically tune arbitrarily between these different regimes. Uh, and so I'm plotting the current density for in a ballistic regime and in a hydro regime. As you can see, uh, so this is just uh, the coordinate along the channel. Um, and as you can see, actually, these don't look that different. Uh, there's no qualitative difference between these two. But then interestingly, the magnetic fields actually help us again because if I add a magnetic field, I can also now measure the whole electric field. So the transverse electric field, and I can look at its profile along the cross-section of the channel. And, and in the ballistic case, actually the whole electric field is fairly flat in the center of the channel, while actually in the, in the hydro case, it also has this uh, parabolic shape. And the reason why that's the case in the hydro regime is actually because there is a fairly simple relation between the whole electric field and the current profile. And so if this one is, is curved, actually uh, this one will also be. So basically the idea is that looking at the curvature of this whole electric field is actually a very convenient uh, quantity to look at. And we can even plot, uh, if you want, like a phase diagram of these different regimes of transport by, by plotting this kappa, which is the curvature of the, of the curvature of the whole electric field and the current. And as you can see, the curvature of the whole electric field is actually a much more uh, uh, accurate uh, distinguisher between, between these, uh, these phases because actually it even changes sign as you go from the Poiseuil flow to ballistic. And, and so this was motivated by this experiment. Uh, and so I, I was lucky enough to actually collaborate closely with the group of Shahalilani at the Weizmann Institute where what they do is that they can actually measure uh, 
the electrostatic potential everywhere, uh, basically uh, right above the sample. And, and to do that, they actually use a single electron transistor uh, that is uh, made out of a carbon nanotube. And by doing so, and again, adding a magnetic field, um, they can, so while they cannot measure directly the, the, current, the, the, the current density, they can measure the, the electric potential and therefore the whole electric field. And, and as you can see now, t these are measurements of the whole field at low temperature where we, are, where we are believed to be in the ballistic regime, where it's very flat, and then you have the same uh, quantity, but now at higher temperature, where LMC has become small enough that we are expected to be in the hydro regime, and you can see that the curvature is actually uh, growing. And, and, and again, so using this uh, curvature uh, observable and, and mapping it to uh, the Boltzmann calculations that we did, we could actually map out where we were, uh, where these samples were in, uh, as a function of temperature, gate voltage, and interspace diagram. And, and we could actually show that uh, there was some significant uh, portion of the Poisson flow that was actually uh, explored with this experiment. So um, I think I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. So um, you can find the details uh, of what I talked about in, in these papers. And now let me acknowledge uh, my collaborators in uh, Berkeley at the Max Planck in Dresden at the Weizmann Institute. And uh, let me thank you for your attention.